when Alex asked me to speak about uh, the topic for this conference, um, I always, kind of my home base is Jungian psychology. So Jung has a wonderful integration of psychology and spirituality and myth and metaphor that I think are really important in terms of most of the essential life issues. But probably the most consistent factor in life is that it brings suffering. Um, I talk about this with my clients and my students, and some of my students are saying, well, that's kind of a downer. Mm -hmm. And uh, it may be, but it's, it is also something that we have to learn to do, is tolerate the suffering that comes to us through life. And one of the things that Jung looked at is, well, what, what makes the difference between someone that can be transformed through their suffering and others who become bitter or rigid, continue to suffer long after the event happened? That's what I wanted to look at with us today. The, the image of gold is one that's an ancient one in terms of transformation. There's a lot of other images. Um, that have been used. Um, the metaphor is really of a Western. Um, in Eastern religions, it's more the diamond that is looked at as the essence of God. Uh, in Western tradition, it's gold. So we had the tradition of the alchemists in early days who were trying to find out how to make gold. Uh, really a metaphor for how to find God through substances that are, are inert. But the other thing about gold is it has to be purified. It, it has to go through fire in order to become the beautiful substance that we see. If you just pick up a raw piece of gold, it's not shiny and pretty. So in fact, I use that metaphor a lot with clients, particularly who are dating. So some, those of you who are single might appreciate this, and those of you who used to be might remember. Sometimes you pick up fool's gold, you know, it looks all glittery and shiny, um, and you think, oh, I found gold, you know. And then later on you find out, man, this is uh, a rock. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, I can just imagine the, the gold rush, uh, the first people to come to California uh, stumbling upon shiny pyrite and thinking they found gold. Uh, realizing that what lies on the ground and what's easy to find is not precious. Okay, so one of the reasons why gold is so valuable to us is because there is a lot of work involved in, in finding true gold. So I'm gonna, uh, I'd like to explore a little bit about the challenges of life and how that could help us. There we go. Okay. All right, so I'm going to ask you some questions. I like to interact with the audience. Uh, what are some of the typical challenges of life? What kinds of things do people confront in general? Death. Unemployment. Yeah. Unemployment. Illness. Illness. Absolutely. Divorce. Divorce. You know, what's that? Betrayal. Betrayal, yeah. Beliefs. Beliefs. Yeah, those can, those can be actually difficult when you're confronted with a different set that challenge the ones you've had. <coughs> These are challenges because they're normal, but they still are difficult. Um, just because death is normal doesn't mean it doesn't, isn't painful when someone you love dies. Um, and so we've kind of hit that, severe illness, sometimes chronic. Uh, can really challenge financial difficulties, so unemployment or just uh, downsizing. So we've hit a lot of these just as a society recently. Addictions, all kinds. I mean, you know, you could go on about what we do to avoid um, true suffering. We just give ourselves fake ones. Divorce. Okay, so what do, what do you hear? What do people typically assume when they are facing a life challenge? What do you hear people say? Here we go again. Oh, here we go again. Why does this always happen to me? Why me? Why me? It's like God has his finger on you. 
Everybody else is fine but you. You're Job from the Bible. Anything else? People say. What am I going to do? Yeah. Overwhelmed. I don't know how to handle this. Sometimes people say, I shouldn't have this happen to me. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, maybe if I had done something differently, it would have worked out better, as though there's this life script. If you just figure it out correctly, you'll never have a challenge. So if you have a challenge, you did something wrong. There is sometimes a lot of shame. Shame, because of that. Absolutely. Yeah, there's a lot of shame. Um, my experience clinically is that that's probably the biggest problem with it's not enough to have to go through a difficulty, but then to load up ourselves with shame as though we caused this. Even if you did, you didn't do it knowingly. Nobody gets up in the morning and says, oh, I think I'm going to cause myself suffering today. <laughs> I didn't have it on my game plan, but that might be a good one. So people unknowingly may, and we can learn things to maybe prevent. In my case, I work with people who may be going through a divorce. We're trying to avoid the next one. Okay, we don't want to continue this. And at the same time, we want to understand what lessons there are here for us. And I think any challenge that comes to life, the difficulty, you have to hold on to the fact that you, if you're going to suffer, I always tell my clients, get something out of it. Right? Because the worst suffering is pointless suffering. Meaningless. And uh, that's the idea life should be smooth. You know, we're always comparing ourselves to other people, right? They all look good. You guys look great. Apparently you have no suffering. You all look very good to me. So if I'm having a bad day, I'm looking around at you saying, well, they all look good. They must have happy lives. I'm the only one with the unhappy one. So we do compare ourselves and we do think, you know, things should be smooth. Things should be easy. I've done something wrong. Other people have it easier than me. Or it's someone else's fault. Now that's a difficult one. I like to go there generally myself first. <laughs> Who can I blame? Then I'm off the hook. But unfortunately, it doesn't always work that way. My husband's here. He's usually the first candidate. <laughs> um, but it is difficult as a therapist because I can't assist my client in changing whatever they contributed to their issue if they don't at least see their contribution. It's usually not 100%. God is out to get me. My brother-in-law loves this one. He's special, anointed by God to be the sufferer of the world, and every time something bad happens, they do, why me, you know? In fact, one time he called with good news, and I said, gee, Steve, why you? <laughs> okay, don't look at the bad things. <laughs> so we do have our cultural attitudes. Uh, one is there's no benefit to pain. Okay, so this has kind of gone along with our wonderful medical technology. Thank God for that. I mean, my goodness. Um, you know, I have a very good friend who had her kidney disease. Kidneys fail, she has a new kidney, she's active and productive. That's just amazing to me. However, one of the other things that have come from our ability to address things like pain pharmaceutically is that we don't think there should be any pain. Now that's an interesting idea because one of the things that has been learned, oh, maybe the last 30, 40 years is the benefit of pain physically. Uh, one of, and I can't, I'm dropping his name, but he's a famous doctor who worked with leprosy patients in India. And what he discovered, he was also a researcher, was that actually leprosy was not the problem per se, it was the, the way that it killed the nerve cells so that you don't feel pain. 
And when you don't feel pain, you don't you know you've cut yourself, you don't know you have a wound, you ignore it because you don't know, and then that's what causes the issues. So the, the lack of pain is the problem with that disease. If you don't have pain, you can't pay attention to the smaller things that are problematic. And in fact, some of my clients have that issue. They don't notice things. I always say we have to you know, lower your pain tolerance because it's too high. You don't notice painful interactions with people until they get too big. So they, there is a benefit to pain if you can gain from some insight from it. Winning is everything. So we, we're always in this kind of competition. Starts out in school, you know, who got the highest grade? I, I teach graduate school, and one of the things I ask my students to do, because this is their last degree usually, is could you once in your life give up the A? You know, I've never asked, I've never been asked by a client what my GPA was. Now, don't you tell your friends to come to me and ask me. But they never say, gee, Dr. Bacon, I would have come to you, but I found out you got a B in that class in <laughs> Pacific, so forget it. And what happens is the focus becomes on a grade and not on the learning. And, and so I'm always saying, gee, you know, could you just learn? Because you're going to work with people and you have to help them, and they don't care what grade you got. They want to know that you learned. So we're very competitive, and there's only one winner. You know, we were watching the Olympics last summer, and you know, you don't remember about the silver or the bronze, hardly even remember the gold, but you know, at that moment, that's who, who counts. All these people that worked for years and years in our mind aren't as important. And so what happens when challenges come is people think you're, you've lost something. You've lost in some mythical game that you're playing in life. Now, it is nice to do well and to do and strive for excellence. But this, uh, one, somebody once said, comparison is the death of contentment. So if you want to have a miserable day, go out and compare yourself to everybody else. It works every time. Okay. So, you know, if you're having too good of a day and you want to bring yourself down, just do that. Okay. The end justifies the means. Now, we all know. Not necessarily the right way to live, but there are a lot of people that do think so. Success validates your existence. It could be your success, your children, that's even tougher because those of you who have kids know you're very limited in how much you can influence them. Um, and, and other people's success, so not only yours, but now your family's, and you, now you're starting to get really global here on things that you have very little control over. So we've lost the ability to see suffering as any kind of value. Now, that being said, it's not to deny suffering that people have you know, experience physically and that they shouldn't have assistance with that. Okay? I'm really talking about uh, psychological and spiritual suffering. So in the Middle Ages, before we had all this wonderful medical um, science, people were left with a lot of suffering physically. And one of the things that was useful to people was to see this as participating in this, in this case with Christ's suffering. In some ways there was a redemption of their own suffering because it meant they were connected to something larger than themselves. Something divine and something meaningful. So what has happened, and research has shown this too, is the more we become focused on getting rid of pain, the more pain people have. So there's an example with pain medication, that it will actually make your pain worse. Mm -hmm. That's the irony. That your body becomes less able to produce endorphins, and so you actually, there becomes a cycle of you take more pain medication, you have higher levels of pain, okay? And I think that's true for us emotionally and physically and socially. We just don't tolerate pain very well because we haven't learned how to do that and we don't have a metaphor for it as a culture anymore. 
And we isolate ourselves then as a result. There's no communal aspect to it. We are ashamed. The shame aspect makes us feel as though we can't really share this with others. We failed somehow. So that, of course, compounds your suffering as well. But spiritual insights, and we'll get back to Jung, because Jung really studied all kinds of spiritual traditions. He, he was very curious. He, I would say, was more of an anthropological kind of uh, person prior to becoming a psychiatrist. So he had studied human cultures from all over the world. And much of the insights that he gained for his psychology came from the study of uh, world religions and uh, spiritual traditions. So life is difficult is a truth. Anybody who's lived long enough knows this. Okay. The irony is if you can accept that, your life becomes less difficult. You're now no longer adding a burden of suffering to yourself that you don't need. In fact, Scott Peck's book, The Road Less Traveled, that's the first phrase that life is difficult. And suffering can be a teacher. So we're, I'm talking globally in, in terms of, of you know, disappointment all the way to you know, profound loss. And it can be a motivation for growth. No one comes to me as a psychologist unless they're in pain, which is fine. They shouldn't. Why would you come in and say, hey, everything's going great. I had some extra money. I wanted to give it to you. Let's spend an hour chatting. That would be nice, but what would be the point? So there's a pain that is stirring that person for a change. And as you all know, we don't necessarily like change. I know. It happens continuously, as we heard earlier in that lovely uh, presentation. Um, it's difficult. It's an interesting phenomenon about humans that we are constantly in change and we don't like it. <laughs> and pain is part of a spiritual journey. There's, there can be a kind of component to that, however you define that. And I think that was Jung's real insight, and that's really what attracted to me uh, to study him more fully in my own uh, work as a psychologist. So when somebody calls me, for example, and says, oh, Dr. Bacon, I need to come in to see you. I'm having a major depression. I always say, good. What? This is a horrible thing. You don't understand. Well, I understand you're in pain, and we want to address that. But something is stirring in you, it's telling you something that you're not paying attention to consciously. It's getting your attention like a smoke detector going off. And, and you know, we're not going to take the batteries out of the smoke detector because it's bugging us. It would be a very foolish thing to do. We need to go see why it is going off. And as soon as we talk about going into the depths, so depression is very much about deepness, darkness, okay? So there's some metaphors for darkness and deepness that are important to hold on to. And you only use this, others have since him. One is that that's where you have to plant a seed. It has to be in the deep, dark soil, okay? If you just scatter it on top of the ground, it will die. So there's a growth component to the depths. And you can't see, when you plant the seed, what's stirring until something pops up. So the same with depression. What do we need to address, for example, in this client's life? What is not being seen by the client consciously that needs to shift? It could be multiple things. Same with anxiety, uh, which is a different issue. It's more of an unwillingness to accept that life has its limitations. Um, so all of the, the types of pain can give you an example from a Jungian point of view as to what might, it's a clue, what might be necessary for this person to address. So there's a natural process of death, decay, and renewal. This is just a constant theme throughout human culture. You have metaphor after metaphor. You've got butterfly, you've got the phoenix rising out of the ashes. Um, you've got all kinds of stories of people who 
heroes in Greek culture who go down into Hades and come out. So it's a natural process that has to happen over and over again as a spiritual process and a psychological process. And one aspect of that is to learn to surrender to what's happening. It is very much like the idea of going down a river. And I think a lot of my clients keep trying to go up the river, which is very difficult, which is why you're exhausted when you have a depression. I don't want to accept the way things are, as opposed to steering through the rapids and navigating, you can do that. But the river is going down one way. You have no choice in that. Very difficult for us to really hold on to that, because people see that as being passive. Now, I've never gone down, I'd love to someday do a raft trip, but a real easy one, not the big ones. <laughs> they have numbered. But, you know, the people who are doing a rafting trip are not passive. They have to steer, they have to be aware of what's going on. So learning to be receptive, to have patience, so that something can awaken, and I think also an attitude of you know, curiosity, what's stirring, what am I not paying attention to? also means you need to have some time for reflection, which is another thing our culture doesn't value, because you're wasting it. One of the things I teach my clients is a mindfulness practice. Very difficult, because nobody has time for five minutes of sitting, unless you're in your car. You have plenty of car, because if you're out here, you're on that car, in that car a lot. So it's, it's it, an unwillingness to sit quietly, because I think it's, it's a resistance all the feelings that come up. So, good. So we, we, there's the natural sufferings that come to you, diseases, death of a loved one, natural disasters. Those are all things we just saw you know, in Oklahoma. Incredible natural disasters. True suffering. And then there's developmental ones that we have to learn the limits of our egos. Now, our culture just does not like this. You are told over and over, you can do anything you want to do. Well, I knew even as a kid, I couldn't do anything. I'm never going to be able to be like a shop you know, person or uh, you know, lift 500 pounds. Uh, there's limitations physically, and you can't, I hate to break the news, but you can't be in two places at one time. I know we'd all like to do this, and we try it. <laughs> Well, maybe if I text, <laughs> and I listen to my teacher, or I do this. <clears throat> but the limitations of being human mean you have to pick. So the fact that you picked to be here means you're not somewhere else right now doing something else. You had to say no to something to be here. And that's life. In fact, with our students, I asked them at the beginning of our program to really reflect on their journey to get to where they are and what they gave up to be in that program. What did they say no to? I think it's, it's you know, an interesting, people just don't necessarily see that. <clears throat> and then there's neurotic suffering. So, longing for growth but, want, but we don't want to pay the price. So we're all guilty of that. The thing with neurotic suffering is you never go anywhere with it. It just keeps going around and around and around and around. Same place over and over. True suffering will bring you from one point of being to another one. That's the difference between those two. So this is what I work with the most as a psychologist, and I think we all struggle with the most. <clears throat> There's an internal conflict, because you have to give something up to change. Now, when, when you give up your children to go to college, there's a change there. Um, they have to give up one way of being and move into another. Uh, weddings are another example of transitions. Why are we crying, you know, half of us? Because there's the loss of one stage of being, even though there's the beginning of a new one. You can never go back. And we recognize that with these ceremonies that are, I think, important. And people do tend to keep their suffering private. They, <clears throat> they tend to feel embarrassed about it. We, we 
uh, in our culture, for example, around the turn of the 20th century, people who were bereaved had a year of mourning. You were black, and it was culturally accepted. Everybody knew you were in, in, in mourning, and you, you know, were treated a little kinder. I was widowed in my early 30s. I didn't get a year, you know. Even though I was in mourning, it wasn't obvious to people. <clears throat> in fact, you might even get um, diagnosed by a psychiatrist with, you know, a depression. I had a, a neighbor who had her husband died after 45 years of marriage, and she was doing pretty well. I thought navigating that. She came to me one day and said, "No, oh, should I take these Prozacs? Why? Oh, my doctor gave them to me. No, you're not depressed. You're sad." <laughs> Sadness is okay, it's a valid emotion. And so we can't even distinguish anymore between sadness and a medical depression, which you know is a different issue. But the thing is with suffering is it allows us to become people who have compassion. And I've seen that time and again when people go consciously through a time of suffering, pain and loss, they are far more compassionate for others are less judgmental of others. Um, something as, easy, as relatively benign, having kids, it has its own form of suffering. <laughs> but it's rare, after you've had kids, to think you know how to do it all. Now, there are some, but generally someone who tells me they would know how exactly how to raise their kids have never had any. Once you have them, you realize, oh, okay. Never mind. <laughs> All those ideas I have flew out the window. So I'll, going through a time of pain and suffering, while you don't need to go out and search for it, okay, it does come to you nonetheless. So one of the things that Carl Jung identified was that some pain and suffering comes from inner processes that are mirrored on the outside. This is where most of my work does come from. Obviously, the, the suffering that comes from being alive and being a human is just what it is. But there's additional suffering that you don't need to have. <clears throat> so this an example it might be a person who feels a lot of guilt and then accuses others of making them feel guilty. Okay? If you didn't feel that guilt on some level, it wouldn't matter what somebody said. You, that's not going to be an issue for you. So, for example, let's say you're torn. Um, sometimes I have this with my students. They want to come to school, but they feel guilty leaving their kids with their spouse and you know taking on an additional role, being a student. So let's say their mother says, oh, I don't know if you should be leaving your kids at home. With your husband, you ought to be there. You're not spending enough time with them. They might get in a big argument with their mother. What are you saying to me? You should be supportive of me. Because part of them thinks she's right. Oh, maybe I shouldn't be doing this. So it's the internal conflict that's really the issue. And how to assist the person in recognizing that, rather than always looking to the outside. Well, she needs to quit doing that, and he needs to quit doing that. Well, good luck. You know, because you're going to have to teach the whole world how to behave appropriately. <laughs> and I have some clients who have tried that. Well, they, they need to learn to respect my boundaries. Well, no, they don't. <laughs> you just need to learn how to hold on to them. <laughs> so people tend to externalize, and they also tend to not see how they contribute, and therefore can't change themselves. Laws can't be responded to in different ways. In fact, I was working with a young boy. His mother died recently, so he's around 10. He's having panic attacks. And he gets scared about what's going to happen in the future. And one of the things we talked about was there will be things that happen in the future that are sad. That's the way life is. But what you, you, so you can't stop them by worrying, by doing anything. So I'm letting you guys know that. You can't stop a bad thing from happening to you. Sorry. But you can promise yourself that what you will do is respond to it, to take care of yourself in the best way that you can. You'll get through it. Okay? That's the promise you can make to yourself. 
cannot prevent a bad thing from happening. And most of us don't believe that, so we try all kinds of ways to stop it. So here's how Jung viewed psychological development, because it ties into this whole idea of suffering. That when an infant is born, they're obviously have a diffused consciousness. In other words, it's you know not integrated in anything. And over time, the ego develops the part of the self that's conscious and recognizes that I am an I, and you're a you. That's the first stage of development for an, an infant. And then society, culture, family, the, the character of the, the personality characteristics of, the, of that child growing up, all of those tie into the person who that person identify with being, which is called the ego. This is good to be, this is not good. And children tend to be very unsophisticated with what's good or not good, so um, it's not always very, uh, I think, it's, as Adler said, that it would be a mistake sometimes, some of the assumptions are mistaken. And you're not aware of those things. You just assume that they're a given. Okay, so you might grow up in a family where if you get angry, this is considered an awful thing, and so you identify anger as bad, and you do everything you can not to have it. However, it is a normal human emotion, so you push it underground, and you have all kinds of issues. Everybody around you is angry usually, and you're never angry. You do it, because they carry it for you. Um, you see it in other people. So this is what one of the things that as a the developmental task in adulthood is to identify these aspects of yourself that you don't own. They're usually not attractive. Uh, the ego certainly doesn't like them. And bring them into consciousness. It doesn't mean you act on them. You know, if there's a part of you that's selfish and wants everything for themselves. Me, I like everything for myself. However, I've learned to say, okay, you know, I can do that. Um, but I'm not going to act on it. To own it means I don't have to give it to somebody else. So that's a process of individuation, becoming whole and integrated. Um, lots of ways to work through that, most easily with a counselor who who understands this. And the goal of bringing in all those split off aspects through looking at dreams, projections, a whole lot of things, is becoming whole. Not perfect, but whole, which is a different thing. And I know I'm running out of time, so I'll just go through these quickly. Um, some of the ideas from Jung is the persona, which is the mask that we put on, and which is okay as long as you know it's a mask and you take it off occasionally. And then the shadow, which is those parts of ourselves that we don't want to own. Um, what Jung said is where we are wounded lies our salvation. So that's an interesting phenomenon coming to a culture that thinks our wounds are shameful. Uh, that the goal that, that holds the key to our transformation is actually in our wounds, where we've been wounded, where we've um, stumbled and fallen. And suffering for Jung was an initiation and a mystery. Something mysterious about this that we can't quantify. But it is part of the human experience. Viktor Frankl, who certainly had his full measure of suffering in the Trump concentration camps, said the manner in which a person takes these things upon himself, assimilates these difficulties into his own psyche, there flows an incalculable multitude of value value potentialities. This means that human life can be fulfilled not only in creating and enjoying, but also in suffering. So here's some suggestions for you in terms of taking your journey inward. And um, as I said, dreams, grief, uh, grief work through drawing, which is something we don't do enough of, writing in journals, poetry, even just reading poetry from really be an experience in and of itself. And contemplative 
practices of which there are many. And compassionate responses to the world. One thing Adler, I think, really did in his psychology, what we've forgotten, is that this should be a part of every human experience as well. And speak to a counselor if you get stuck, um, somebody who's well trained. And I wanted to mention my book because I do talk a lot about suffering and that, even though it focuses on grief, it really pertains to any kind of grief and suffering. So um, I did bring a few of those. And you can also go on my blog, um, I do write periodically about this topic. So thank you all for the opportunity to speak to you.